Hey everyone, Nick Russo here. I intended for this video to be a continuation of my Cisco Live presentation on troubleshooting OSPF. Now, in that presentation, I focused on IPv4 and OSPF v2. I did that because I didn't want to dilute the presentation by jumping into IPv6 and talking about it for 10 minutes and then leaving everyone confused. So instead, I kept my Cisco Live session very targeted and I decided to augment it with this specific video which goes through our first troubleshooting ticket using IPv6 and OSPF v3. Before going through this video, you'll need to watch my troubleshooting OSPF Cisco Live session. Doesn't really matter which version of it you watch, so long as you watch one and get familiar with the core concepts behind the OSPF graph tracing technique that I teach. So here's the topology that we're going to be using, and this was from the Cisco Live presentation, and our problem is that we're trying to do a web download from R1 to R4, but it's not working and R14 was recently hardened and turned basically into a network firewall. And right now we only get access to R4 and we need to find some way that we can troubleshoot this entire network even though we can only access one device. I've labeled the interfaces on here to make it easier. You may want to take a snapshot of this to have it as a quick reference as we go through the exercise. Also note that all of the physical interfaces are going to have the same link local address, which I kept a very simple format as you can see at the bottom, and each device is going to have a loopback address also at the bottom. We really only care about the R1 and R4 loopbacks for this particular demo, but I'll be sure to talk a little bit about how prefixes are advertised within OSPF v3. So at this point, we only get access to R4, so let's dive into the demo. All right, now that we've seen the topology and we have a high level understanding of what we're going to accomplish, let's see if we can solve this problem. So the first thing we want to do is just verify that we actually have a problem. So let's check our routing table and just make sure that R4 even has a route to R1's loopback, which is FC00 colon colon 1 128. Okay, that looks good to me. The next hop looks like R2, which is the correct path. So let's do a quick ping and a trace route and make sure that those are successful also. Okay, so it looks like the traffic is functional and it's flowing through R2 without going any other funky paths. We don't really know about the return traffic though, and that's what we're going to troubleshoot. So let's test our actual application. Let's see if we can do a web download from R1 and see if that works. In my Cisco Live demo, I used the DL alias to perform an IPv4 download, and I've created a new alias called DL6, which will do the same thing except using IPv6. Okay, so this didn't work. So the web download doesn't work, just like IPv4. How can we troubleshoot this problem? Again, we don't have access to R1 or any other device, so we need to figure it out from R4. We're going to draw the OSPF v3 graph starting with R4's router LSA. Now this is a very long and very specific command. I'm specifying process ID 1, which is the OSPF v3 process I'm running. I'm also specifying area 0 because R4 is participating in area 0, area 1, and area 4, but we don't really care about those other areas right now, so I want to be very specific. I'm trying to look at the router LSAs and I only want to see the one advertised by myself right now. So advertising router should be 10.0.0.4. Remember, OSPF v3 uses an IPv4 style dotted decimal router ID. When we look at this output, it's quite a bit different than the IPv4 OSPF v2 router LSA. First, there are many fewer links. In this case, there's only two instead of the five we saw before. If you remember with OSPF v2, we had the two point-to-point -point links. We had a connection to R2 and a connection to R5. And we have both of those here as well. So that's pretty similar. And we can see that the cost on each of those links is 10. What we don't see here are the individual prefixes. For example, the loopback address that's on R4, which is FC00 colon colon 4 slash 128. That's not anywhere in here. I'll explain at the end of the video where that comes from, but for now let's just focus on the topology and kind of take note that we don't see any stub networks here. So that's a big difference between OSPF v2 and OSPF v3.
I also want to point out this concept of a local and neighbor interface ID. You might remember from OSPF v2 when we had a point to point link type inside of a router LSA, it would specify the local IPv4 addresses. Well, in IPv6, the concept of IP addressing is a little bit different because we use link local addresses for forming our neighbors. As a result of that, we don't have any globally routable addresses in this database and it doesn't really make sense to put them in there. So we have this new concept of an interface ID. So for example, our connection to R5, that's where we're going to go next. We can see our local interface ID is 4. So how can we verify that? Well, I can tell you based on our diagram that this is Ethernet 0 slash 1. So if we do a quick show command, kind of break away from the database and look at that interface, we should see ID 4 uh, for that specific interface. And this gets exchanged between the OSPF neighbors so you can kind of track what's connected where without needing IPv6 addresses to store that information. So if we look at the details of that specific interface, on that top line we can see interface ID 4. So that's where that number comes from. Again, this is dynamically generated by the router. We don't really care about what these numbers are. I just wanted to show you how you can trace that. We're not going to be looking at these interface IDs in too much detail, but we will record them on our diagram. So let's update our diagram real quick and then we'll move on to R5. Okay, now that we've seen the text output, how can we draw that graphically? Well, we know about R4, which has router ID 10.0.0.4, and we saw two links. These were point to point links which connected to R2 and R5. So when I draw my OSPF graphs like this, I like to make it generally look like the network diagram that just makes it easier to draw and easier to read, but you can draw it any way you like. We also identify the interface IDs on those two connections. So the interface ID from R4's perspective, his local interface ID was six connected to R2, and R4's local interface ID was 4 connected to R5, and both of their costs were 10. And I'm going to show that in parentheses. So at this point, we could continue to either R2 or R5. It doesn't really matter, but I'm going to continue to R5 next. Okay, we just finished up with looking at R4. Now let's take a look at R5. Now remember, we don't have access to any of those other routers, but right here from R4, we can dig into the details of R5 and look at the topology from R5's perspective. To do that, we're going to use the same command we did to look at the router LSA for R4. We're just going to change that, basically that last digit from a 4 to a 5 to look at R5's LSA. So let's type that out real quick. Okay, so this router LSA was originated by R5. We can see the 10.0.0.5 there. We can see that it also has two point-to-point -point links. One of them points back to R4, and we can see those interface IDs, both local and remote. They are the same as what R4 shown earlier. So R4 was showing the same information, except just the router IDs were different because it was two ends of a link. We've also discovered a new router, which is 10.0.0.3, connected on a point-to-point -point link back to R5. And again, just keeping in mind that so far all the link costs look like 10, so let's make sure we update our diagram with this information. Okay, so we just collected R5's router LSA from R4, and we learned a little bit more about how the network is structured. We can see R5 which is router ID 10.0.0.5, it has two links. One of them goes back to R4, so that's kind of that backlink that makes our graph bidirectional with two different unidirectional edges. The cost of both links is 10, and again, I'm showing the interface IDs there. We've also discovered a new node, which is R3 with router ID 10.0.0.3. Let's explore router 3 next. So again, to do that, I'm going to type that command out again, and as you're learning this, I recommend that you don't use the up arrow to make it easier on yourself. If you type the whole command from scratch, it'll really start to build your muscle memory, and it'll help you master how to troubleshoot this a little bit faster in real life. R3 is a little bit different than the other routers. So clearly this is Router 3's Router LSA. We can see the advertising router at the top. It's connected to another router on a point-to-point -point link with a cost of 10. 
we can see the local and remote interface IDs are six. Again, I'm not gonna go through all showing the interfaces because it's really not relevant for graph tracing, but we'll make sure we annotate that on our diagrams. We can see that that neighbor was 10.0.0.5, so that was that backlink towards R5. If you remember from the Cisco Live session, remember we need that bi-directional edges to be formed. So it's very important that the graph is complete this way. We have this new kind of link called a transit network. And we can see the data here is a little bit different. It still has a local interface ID and a cost, which makes sense. But at the bottom, there's a couple new pieces of information. There's still a neighbor interface ID and a neighbor router ID, but they are specific to the designated router. So this LSA answers the question, who is the DR on this network segment? Well, it's saying that the DR interface ID is four, Okay, well, our local interface ID is four, so that kind of hints that we might be the DR, and then it shows the DR router ID, which is, in fact, our own router three's IP address. Okay, so we've got this new pseudo node in the network. Before we draw it, let's go back to our diagram and add R3, and then we'll explore this designated router next. All right, we just took a look at R3 on the command line. We can see that R3 has two links, it has its backlink to R5, the ID is 6, and the cost is 10, so that looks good. We've also discovered a new kind of link, which is a transit network. Now, this concept is the same as OSPF v2 with a few small differences. One difference is that the, quote, router ID of the DR is going to be the actual router ID of the node hosting it, as opposed to a specific IP address on an interface. This is a minor difference with OSPF v2. We can see that R3 is connected to the DR using ID4 and cost 10, so there's really nothing to be suspicious about yet. Let's take a look at the DR next, which is the first time that we are seeing a network LSA. Okay, so we've got our diagram updated. Let's dig into this transit network a little bit more and see how it works. Remember, this is called a network LSA, and it's going to basically have a list of all connected routers on the segment. And just looking at our diagram, we would expect to see routers 1, 2, and 3. This is a pretty small LSA because it communicates a relatively small amount of information. But we can see in the header, it shows that the link state ID and advertising router for this particular LSA are 4. Remember, that was the local interface on R3 and also R3's router ID. Now you'll notice that there's not like a subnet mask or anything included in this LSA, unlike OSPF v2, and that's because OSPF v3 is much more decoupled from the underlying IP addresses, and we don't really need to carry that information anymore because we can add as many addresses as we want, and those are going to be transferred again in a different LSA, the intra-area prefix LSA, or type 9. We'll take a look at that later, but just be aware of these minor differences between OSPF v2 and v3. Most importantly, we can see the list of attached routers at the bottom. Again, we see routers 3, 1, and 2, like we expected. So at this point, let's go update our diagram with this new designated router, keeping in mind that all of the DR's interfaces have a cost of zero, so we'll be sure to annotate that, and then we'll take a look at R2 next. All right, so we just took a look at our network LSA, and basically it just had a list of attached routers. We saw router 1, which was 10.0.0.1. We saw router 2, which is 10.0.0.2. That was a node that we already knew about from R4. We just haven't explored it in detail yet. And of course, the connection back to R3, which is the physical device that is hosting or creating this pseudo node. Remember that all the costs from the DR's perspective are zero because we don't want to incur extra costs from an OSPF perspective just because we decided to use a broadcast style of OSPF network. So at this point, we have two nodes we haven't explored, R1 and R2. I'm going to go to R2 just to make this video a little bit longer and more interesting, even though you can probably guess that the issue is going to be sitting on R1. So let's take a look at R2 next. We just took a look at the DR. Let's break open R2's router LSA to see how it connects to the rest of the network. So this LSA so far has the most information out of any of them, and there are three different individual links described here. If you look at R2's placement in the network, this makes sense because R2 is connected on three different interfaces. 
First, we have our backlink to R4 with a cost of 10. You might remember that those local interfaces were marked as 6 earlier, so those marry up okay. We then have a link to a new device called R14 that we haven't explored yet. Again, cost is 10, don't really see anything fishy there. We'll be sure to add it to our diagram though. And last, we have this connection to a transit network. Again, cost looks just fine, but here I want to focus on the DR router ID. So obviously in this case, it's not R2 anymore, it's R3, which is consistent with the rest of the network because all the routers have to agree on who the designated router is from a topology perspective. And R2 is saying, yep, I've received this LSA and R3 is the DR. So let's update our diagram with these new links. Again, we've got a backlink to R4. We've got another backlink to the DR, so that completes those. But then we have a new link to R14 and we'll explore that next. All right, here we go with R2. We've got router ID 10.0.0.2. This node has three links. It's got that connection to the designated router, which is a transit network, cost 10, nothing crazy there, as well as two point-to-point -point links. One, that is the backlink to R4. Again, we discovered R2 a while ago, but finally we see that edge that points back to R4. We've also discovered a new node, which is R14 up in the top left. And this was the node that, from our scenario, was the one that got hardened. So maybe there's a, a misconfiguration from an OSPF perspective on R14. Let's jump over to R14 and see if that's true. All right, we've only got a couple routers left. So let's explore R14's router LSA and see how it sees the network. Maybe we'll uncover a fault there. All right, so we're looking at R14's router LSA here, it was originated by 10.0.0.14, no surprises there. Looks like the cost on both links is 10, so probably not an issue here. We can see our backlink, our point-to-point -point link with local ID 5 going back to router 2. We can see the router ID there, that proves it. Then we have R1. Now we discovered R1 earlier because it was connected to that transit network, was connected to that network LSA or that designated router, but for the purpose of keeping this interesting, I didn't want to jump right to R1. As you can probably guess, that's where the problem is. But now we've discovered R1 another way. So we've completed the entire graph with the exception of R1. So let's update our diagram and then we'll zero in on R1 to finish up. Okay, so we took a look at R14, has router ID 10.0.0.14 and two point-to-point -point links. One of them has ID 5, the other has ID 3. We can see that they go to R2 and R1 respectively. Both of the costs are 10, so it doesn't appear to be any misconfigurations there. The last node we need to look at is R1. And again, as you can probably guess, this is where we're going to find our bug. So let's dive into that next. Okay, so our diagram is almost complete. Let's explore R1's router LSA and see if we can uncover the problem. So it looks like router one has two links. The first is a transit network connects to the designated router. And again, the DR is 10.0.0.3. So that's consistent with what we expected. We also have a point-to-point -point link back from R1 to R14. We can clearly see the cost is 10 and the router ID is 10.0.0.14. So feel free to pause the video if you need a second and see if you can point out what the issue is and try to articulate to yourself why the issue is causing our problem with our application. So if you're able to find the issue, congratulations. The link metric or the cost basically on the transit network is 100. Now, if you look at the diagram, what this is going to cause is an asymmetric routing problem through R14. And if you remember from the scenario, we hardened R14 earlier, and maybe we put some kind of security policy on it, which denies web traffic. And in reality, that's exactly what I did. So at this point, now that we've discovered the issue, basically using one command on one router, you know, we just rooted around the database and we solved this problem across the network, let's magically get access to R1 I'll fix this problem, we'll verify with a show command that it was fixed on R4, then we'll try performing our web download again. Okay, looking at this new show command output, we can see that the cost on that transit network has been reduced to 10. So at this point, 
We've seen all the costs in the network. We know that all of them are 10 now. So we can test this by trying to do our web download again. And if it works, we can assume that our routing has been fixed. All right, this looks great. We can download our file now. As a final check, I'll just log into R1 and do a trace route just to prove that we did actually fix the routing problem. Okay, that looks right. We do a trace route from R1 to R4's loopback and it transits R2 and that's it. No more R14 in the path. Okay, we finally finished and we looked at R1. It's got one point to point link back to R14. That's kind of our backlink and cost is 10, so nothing crazy there. Then we have a connection to our transit network, which had cost 100 and ID 4. The cost of 100 to the DR is causing an asymmetric routing condition where R1 is preferring the path through R14 to reach R4. And because R14 was recently hardened and turned into a firewall, we can hypothesize that our web traffic is being dropped, so we can't do that web download that we tried to do. Once we corrected that problem, then the web download worked just fine. Now that we've finished our graph tracing, I want to cover two other topics really quickly. So I mentioned earlier that we've got a few new LSAs with OSPF v3, and I don't want to turn this into a LSA deep dive, but I feel like you need to understand these two at a basic level in order to be good with graph tracing. So let's cover the easy one first, which is the intra area prefix LSA. So we're still using a database show command, except instead of specifying router or network, now I'm specifying prefix. And I want to look at my self originated one. So again, the formal name is intra area prefix LSA, and we can see at the bottom it has a list of prefixes. Now you can see here it says number of prefixes one. This LSA can actually carry many prefixes. It can take a list of these objects. In this case, it only has a single loopback, which is FC00 colon colon four, and then the mask is slash 128. So this is R4's loopback. So OSPF v3 describes a number of bits that can be set on these individual prefixes. And in this case, the LA bit is the local address bit. That just indicates that this specific prefix is configured locally on R4. So all the different devices who have prefixes locally assigned are going to originate this LSA. And by decoupling the topology from the prefixes, whenever there's a change in the addressing, for example, if I add new loopbacks or I update some IPv6 addresses, it won't trigger a full SPF run and that can really help OSPF v3 scale. For those familiar with IS to IS, this was always the way it worked and one of the big drawbacks of OSPF v2 is that both the leaf information and the vertices and edges were all munged together in that router LSA. OSPF v3 breaks those apart. The last LSA is kind of a glue that I didn't want to talk about earlier because I felt like it would be confusing, but in case you're wondering, how did these routers learn what those different interface IDs were? For example, R4 knew what its local interface ID was and what the remote interface ID was on a particular link. And that's how it was able to build that topology and to reconcile those entries within the router LSA. The way it knew that was using the link LSA, which is also informally known as the type 8. So let me show you that real quick. So I'm not going to show all the output from that second one because the bottom isn't very interesting, but the top part is. So notice the LS type for both of these is link LSA, and it also shows in parentheses what interface it's associated with. So just by looking at this LSA, we can see that this is associated with Ethernet 0 slash 3, and its link ID is 6. So this is how the routers know what the different link IDs are. They're carried in the payload of this particular LSA. The LSA also carries the link local address inside of it, which is just another way OSPF e3 can signal that information. You'll also see that the router priority for DR elections is also carried inside of these messages. The last one here at the bottom, again, I'm not showing all of it, but we can see it's for a different interface, this time Ethernet 01. The advertising router is still the same, but we can see the link ID is different. The link IDs have to be different on every link, even if the link local addresses are the same. Again, this helps glue together those router LSAs we looked at earlier.
let's make our way back to the presentation and finish up for the day. Just to wrap up, we talked about the type 8 link LSA and the type 9 intra area prefix LSA. And for completeness, I just wanted to show the full picture of what we did during this video. You can see I've updated the cost on R1's transit network to 10 because we made that correction. So now everything in the network is correct. I've also added in the quote stub networks, the individual leafs or the IPv6 prefixes that are hanging off of each node. Now I didn't update the link count. So for example, R14 doesn't have three links. It still only has two because from a router LSA perspective, the stub networks don't count as links anymore. We didn't go through the whole database and look at all six of these different type nine LSAs, but we did look at a few and I think you get a general idea about how it works. It's important to know that these type nine LSAs can contain a list of prefixes. That's why in the LSA, it'll say number of prefixes X, because of course that number can be greater than one. So from a batching perspective, we can get a little bit better efficiency carrying multiple prefixes around in a single LSA. In our particular case, we only cared about R4 and R1, but I'm just showing all of it here to give you a complete picture. I'd encourage you to draw these diagrams whenever you're given the opportunity to work on your OSPF V3 graph tracing skills. Thanks everyone for your time today. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please let me know if you have any questions about OSPF V3 troubleshooting in the comments, and I'm happy to answer them for you. Thanks everyone.